All right. Try to look interested, will you? I'm going <laughs> to. She's yawning. <laughs> Bored already. Hey, everyone. Ron Spomer here with my partner, Covey. <laughs> if you're not looking at the video and only seeing or hearing a podcast, I have my English setter, Covey, sitting in a chair beside me, and she's looking a little bit spooky because I don't normally let her get up on furniture. <laughs> but I think she's going to be okay while I read a story about bird dogs. This is a magazine article that was published. I don't know when this thing was. I don't see anything on here. Oh, here we go. February of 2001 in American Hunter magazine, and it's titled Bird Dog Buddies. Are you my buddy, Cubby? She's kind of got a hang dog look right now because she's not supposed to be on the furniture. That's okay, Cubby. I give you permission this time. But Covey is a reminder of, well, what we hunters love about our upland and waterfall bird dogs, our retrievers, our flushing dogs. It just adds so much to the adventure. And in the off season, they help us remember what's coming, right? Yeah, we're looking forward to the next season. Yeah, they help keep us in shape. Okay, Covey, I'll tell you what. Shake. Give me a shake. Can you give me a shake? No? You're too cowed. <laughs> All right. Try to look interested, will you? I'm going <laughs> to. She's yawning. <laughs> Bored already. I'm going to read this story, Covey. You can stay here or you can leave. It's up to you. Bird Dog Buddies by Ron Spomer, field editor. I watched a wolf in Alaska one summer and I saw a bird dog. Long legged and thin in its summer coat, it trotted, quartering the wind, head high. Then it turned into the current, quartered back, and paused, scenting. I recognized Pointer in that pose and set her in the sub subsequent stalk as that big wolf tiptoed toward a willow thicket. Then it crouched, slunk, and leaped. A dozen white and brown ptarmigan fluttered up. Behind them, jaws snapping, its back arched and its legs stretched, it was a Springer Spaniel. That's what that wolf looked like. Here was classic, pure upland dog work, the genetic base on which we've built more than a dozen breeds of hunting dogs. They may not look like wolves, but they hunt birds like wolves. I followed a homely German short hair through Kansas snow once, her chocolate coat almost black with moisture. She plodded rather than flowed, her stub tail writhing like, like the back half of a pinched-off angleworm. But pretty is as pretty does, and she was doing beautifully. Cautiously, hopping corn stubble, row by row, sniffing here, poking under yellow leaves, snuffling snow, until her overfed sausage torso stiffened and she stopped. The tail was still. The head pointed down. I took this to be a point, and I waded in, kicking snow from the most obvious hiding place, a small cluster of yellow tumbleweeds. Out popped a rooster pheasant, it too wet and surprisingly dull against the new snow, but there was no disguising that red waddle. I pushed up the browning BPS, thumbed forward the safety, and the bird fell into the snow with a muffled whump, like a book tossed onto a feather pillow. The homely dog was on it like a wolf. For practical reasons alone, a good bird dog makes sense. Finding game, mere humans would walk past. In retrieving cripples we would never find. But an upland dog's worth extends far beyond the practical. How do you measure the visual delight of a springer's eager bounce? The graceful run of a setter tracking in a sea of grass? The burning intensity of a pointer locked up? How do you value the golden retriever that emerges from a square mile of switchgrass carrying a ring neck that you knocked down 15 minutes earlier? The comforting weight of a lab's muzzle resting on your thigh during the drive home? Upland dogs, whether pointer, flusher, or retriever, are more than the sum of their parts. They are bird hunting personified. This is not to say things always go right. At first, I delighted when my young setter finally showed an interest in birds. 
to his flash pointing, then bumping and chasing Gamble's quail. Look how birdie that pup is. Now all we've got to do is get that under control, and she'll hold a point. But Joy soon turned to disgust as we realized pup was scouring the desert, clearing out the quail before the older dogs we had with us could point them. She quickly went into a travel kennel, then a professional training program. The next year she pointed, held and retrieved 15 gambles quail for me in one day, and then went on to point that many more for my friends. Not all pups get better with age or training. Though I wasn't there to witness it, those who were gleefully related the story of Misty's Revenge. Misty was Alan's white setter, a puppy prodigy that inexplicably went haywire in middle age. She got so wild that Alan's hunting partners would watch which direction she headed in the morning and they'd go the opposite direction. She generally returned to camp after dark for refueling. One night she limped back wet, cold, and famished and discovered the offal from the day's take of sage grouse. After she finished eating the raw innards, Alan discovered her. Bad dog, where have you been? Shame on you. I should have put you to bed hungry, but I suppose you're starved. He <laughs> fed the dog and then kenneled it. What? She wouldn't eat. Too tired to eat? Serves you right. Well, during the night, a front moved through and the desert temperature plummeted. Feeling sorry for his worn-out dog, Alan draped his new down jacket over her kennel, assuming she'd barely move until morning. Bad assumption. Misty did quite a bit of moving before dawn, ejecting grouse innards from both ends. <laughs> Similar stories revolve around couches and truck seats. Labs left in cabs have been known to eat not just the upholstery, but also the radio knobs, the stick shifts, and the steering wheels. I once accepted delivery of a half-wild English setter pup that, during a two-hour ride in a travel kennel, thank goodness, vomited several roofing nails, a coil of copper wire, a half an asphalt shingle. Well, her, turns out her former owner had been building a new garage. Such gastronomic peccadilloes make for sparkling dinner conversation, but aren't the real reason we own bird dogs. Tilly's long retrieve is, Tilly was a small English setter white but heavily ticked with black. She would have been beautiful, except she was foreshortened, as if missing one vertebrae. Despite weighing less than 30 pounds, she looked chunky, but she could find birds. One day, I flushed a wild covey of gray partridge above Idaho's Snake River, and I watched them glide through a low notch and plummet into the canyon below. Thinking we might relocate those birds, I whistled Tilly over and headed toward that notch. While we were still some 200 yards away, that setter locked up. Guessing that a partridge had dropped from the covey early without my noticing, I stepped in, but nothing flushed. Tilly remained staunch. I kicked and crossed and stamped, but nothing flushed. Finally, I released that dog to relocate, and instead she cruised through the notch without so much as a pause. The only explanation that made sense at the time was that she had detected the scent washed from the birds as they glided through that gap. We never did relocate the covey, but much farther down the canyon, she pointed a small bunch of chuckers, one of which tumbled behind the back side of a ridge at my second shot. Tilly, a half-hearted retriever at best, disappeared over the top. Figuring I'd have to help her find that bird, I ran to the top, but no dog, no bird. I whistled, called, shouted, where the heck could she have gone? I was denigrating that center and all setter gene pools in general when one particular white and black setter emerged from a tangle of poison ivy vines in a draw 300 feet below. It was Tilly, bearing a wing-clipped chucker right to my hand. Forgive me, Tilly, wherever you are. Though I'm a confirmed setter man, I acknowledge the often superior bird-finding abilities of high-bred English pointers. A cartoonist would draw them as a giant nose propelled by four wiry legs driven to top speed by a whip tail. Dale Woolheiser's Jake was a perfect example. That scrawny white pointer could detect unscented deodorant in a vacuum. Jake once locked on point while I sent my Springer in to flush two times 
The only thing that flushed was my face after I called the Springer to heal. Then Dale stepped up to boot out a rooster pheasant from the brush. Jake's fault, though, was wanderlust. Turn him loose, and you were lucky to see him again before the drive back home. Oh, he'd have birds pinned, but they'd often get bored and walk away before we ever found him. There wasn't a bell or a beeper loud enough to reach us from where Jake took some of his more far-flung outposts. One October afternoon, Dale and I were walking a brushy drawback to the truck, hoping to encounter Jake along the way. When the truck came into view and Jake hadn't, Dale turned around to look and whistled and cursed and called. Well, the last time I saw him, he was down by the creek. I'll wait here. Well, I considered kicking through the dogwood and rose thickets at the bottom of that runoff draw, but we'd been through it earlier, and I could see there was an old white milk jug or a scrap of seed bag in the bottom of it, but, yeah, well, birds would be unlikely. So I just laid down and took a nap while Dale went looking for his dog. Well, Dale returned about 15 minutes later, dogless. Yeah, he could be clearing the Canadian customs about now, he said. Maybe we'll find him along the road. Okay, I said. Hey, what's that white thing in the bottom of the draw? Oh, that's an old milk jug or something. No. No, Dale says, I think it's Jake. Jake? Is that you? Hey, it is. Can you get down to him? I think he's on point. <laughs> well, of course, I bowled my way through a nearly impenetrable thorn thicket, and I put up a rooster and shot it. In the final 300 yards to the truck, Jake disappeared again. <laughs> that dog had been pointing at rooster for 15 minutes. Now, not all points are as welcome as Jake's. David Lockwood's young German wire hair, Autumn, pointed him towards serious trouble two years ago. David was hunting Idaho's vast Owyhee country, a sagebrush desert laced with brushy stream valleys. Well, when Autumn pointed into a thicket of willows, Dave assumed quail and began tossing rocks to dislodge them. A mountain lion jumped out instead. David allowed us how his 20-gauge felt awfully small at the time. The cat scowled over its shoulder a time or two, clearly displeased with the disturbance, but it slunk away. My favorite breed for pheasants in heavy cover is the Springer Spaniel. They're lively, eager, and always ready to dive into the worst tangle of vegetation where they track down every last bird and push it into the sky. This works fine until there are too many birds. My first Springer, Boo, trained on rust grouse and the occasional pheasant in North Idaho. Then we went to South Dakota, and it was baptism by fire. <laughs> all that CRP grass, Mike said, it's ours. You can start anywhere and hunt all of it. Mike Weatherman was a ranch manager and a ranch near Winter. Well, Boo and I hit the ground running, and within 50 yards of the, off the road, we got our first bird one of a pair that Boo pushed from the dense switchgrass. Atta girl, fetch, fetch. I watched her progress. I watched her progress by the wriggling of the tall grass. But just before she reached the spot where that bird had fallen, another pheasant flushed, and then another, and another, until I could no longer see the grass wriggling. Flushing pheasants like hats tossed at a graduation marked Boo's frenzied progress through a quarter mile of paradise. When I finally caught up with her, she had the look of a 70s rock star. Following that overdose, Boo settled in nicely, seeming to expect feathered cornucopia at every occurrence. If I didn't shoot and knock a bird down, she wouldn't chase it. Late one afternoon, we walked into a cut milo field on Weatherman's ranch, one bird shy of our limit. Well, two went up before Boo's, Boo's snuffling. They caught a strong south wind and curved back to my right. I pushed the 20-gauge past, slapped the trigger, and dropped the rooster into a closely cropped alfalfa field. Get him, Boo! Black ears flopping like Dumbo the flying elephant, my black and white partner leaped the stubble rose and disappeared. When she didn't come back after a reasonable time, I stepped out to find an empty field. No Boo. No pheasant, no sign of anything. There was a double line of big cylindrical hay bales, and I thought perhaps Boo was chasing a cripple behind them. But I looked down both sides and again found nothing. Where could that dog have gone? And then, from the narrow hole between those closely stacked bale piles, emerged the tail of a pheasant, followed by the black nose carrying it. 
Here it is, boss. Darn thing ran into this tunnel. It's dark in there, you know. Well, that wasn't Little Boo's last pheasant, but the one that she retrieved from an icy South Dakota slough last December probably was. Last July, someone stole 10-year-old Boo from my front yard. and Life hasn't been the same since. Mike Larson has discovered that the Springer's little cousin, the hunting cocker spaniel, is equally enthusiastic for pheasants, even though his 20-pound dog Emma weighs only slightly more than the game she retrieves. Last October, I hit a sharp-tailed grouse that negotiated a controlled crash landing several hundred yards ahead of both Mike and me. Given the dense cover in that draw, I despaired of ever seeing that bird again. But when Emma bounced within scent range of the landing site, she wriggled into a tangle that would have held a hundred-pound lab at bay. Then she emerged with that sharp tail still alive. Most of my Kansas hunting buddies run Brittany's, a close-working, versatile breed that has never appealed to me except for all the times that they've pointed and fetched quail and pheasants for me. You can hunt this section from here back to the house, Tom said as he stopped the truck. You want to take a dog? Oh, I don't know, I said to my old buddy. You think they'll hunt for me? Well, Susie will. Well, I didn't want to sound ungrateful, but I didn't have high hopes for that dog, having seen too many of her shenanigans. She busted birds before hunters were even close enough to shoot. Still, when a buddy offers you his dog, what are you going to do? All right, Tom, I'll take her. As Tom drove off, I held on to the young dog to keep her from chasing the truck. After it was out of sight, I took her orange and white face in my hands and I spoke into her eyes. Listen, dog, all I ask is that you don't chase every blamed pheasant away before we get to the house, okay? You can go off by yourself if you want. I won't tell on you. Just don't run all the birds off. Then the dog and I set off toward a harvested cornfield where little Susie quickly established a point. A firm point. Well, assuming she was at least half serious, I walked over, gun at port arms. A cock pheasant busted into the wind and I knocked him down. Well, all right. Good girl. Good dog. Well, I'll be. Well, so we continued, pushing that broken stock cornfield to a weedy fence line corner. And then another point. And another rooster and another retrieve. Finally, out in a big pasture dotted with clumps of saber-leafed yucca, that splendid little Brittany established yet another point. No way, I said as I stepped past her, expecting a jackrabbit or maybe a stray prairie chicken. But a long-tailed old ringneck shot out and I recovered in time to slap him down, wing-clipped. Get him, get him, I shouted into the wind as Tom's pet Brittany tore past me. Well, did she hunt for you, Tom asked when he pulled in later that evening. I held aloft three prime pheasants. You wouldn't want to sell that dog, Tom, would you? Yeah, boy, I didn't <laughs> didn't remember I had all those great dog adventures, but now that I read about them, they sure come back. Uh, many, many a hunt with good dogs like this cubby here. She's my latest setter. What are you, number 10 or so? I had a lot of setters before you, you know that? You don't care, do you? We had a really good season last year. Covey and I hunted Idaho, and my idea was to take one of every species of upland game birds that can be hunted in this state and there are nine of them so we went out looking and we got eight out of nine and the goal was covey had to locate them point them i had to shoot them she had to retrieve them and we got eight of them the only one we missed was the spruce grouse and that one is pretty rare it's southern idaho is a southern limit for that bird so you've got to go up to seven eight thousand feet it's about as low as they ever get you got to go pretty high and pretty far north in Idaho to find them. And my favorite spot last year was involved in a forest fire. So we couldn't even get in there because of all the smoke and stuff. So we pioneered some new areas and tried to find one, but hadn't have any luck. But boy, we got a sage grouse and sharp tails and pheasants and huns and chuckers and quail and rough grouse and dusky grouse. Covey did a great job. Yes, you did, Covey. <laughs> what are you scratching? Hey, if you guys love to bird hunt or want to become a bird hunter, more power to you. The nice thing about upland bird hunting is that the seasons are long. The bag limits are pretty generous. You can usually get from two to 10, depending on the species in the area. And that gives you the opportunity to get out and hunt more. You know, you shoot once on your deer and your deer season's over, your elk season. 
But with birds, it's like every day, as long as you're eating them, you can go get more. And, and if you take a bird dog with you, it just makes it that much more fun. You get the satisfaction of watching your dog do a good job or the frustration of watching her do a bad one. <laughs> but you're a team, and watching the dog, most guys will tell you half the fun is just watching your dog work. So it adds a whole other level of uh, enjoyment to the hunt. So that's why Covey and I go after him, isn't it? Yeah, good girl. Hey, this is Ron Spomer. Thanks for listening, guys. If you want to uh, catch my YouTube channel with more topics on guns and ammo and ballistics and hunting and shooting stuff, go to Ron Spomer Outdoors on YouTube. And you can also subscribe to Ron Spomer um, Television. It's called rsotv.com. You can find that on our website, ronspomeroutdoors.com. And on there, we cover topics that you can't necessarily cover on public forums. Um, information on hand loading and repairing guns and tweaking guns and mounting scopes and all that fun stuff. But uh, Covey and I are going to take a break now. And we're wishing all of you the best of luck and fun of field and success. And if you take a dog, even if you don't get any birds, you're going to have fun and a success. Right, Covey? Yeah. <laughs> So until next time, this is Ron Swomer. Hunt honest and shoot straight.